I know I've been asking this question for a few weeks. This is the last week I'll ask it, I promise. So let's imagine. Let's imagine you are in the most beautiful, sacred place you can think of. And you're messing around and something beautiful and priceless gets broken. And Jesus, what does Jesus do? So theologians and Christian communities have wrestled with this for a very long time, for a couple of thousands of years. And, and, and you know, they've come up with a lot of different answers. What would Jesus do? Some believe that Jesus waits. He, he waits until we say a prayer, inviting him into our lives. Other Christian communities, theologians have said, Jesus covers us up so that way God can't see our brokenness. Other Christian communities have said, you know, when we break things and, and we're broken, that Jesus gives us a list of things to do, confession and prayer and worship. What do you think? What would Jesus do? My son, my oldest son, Devin, he has, is, and has always been rambunctious, tenacious. He is a free spirit. And I know some of you have heard this story before, but it just felt worth sharing again. You see, I remember this moment. He was two, maybe three, so he was just a little guy. And somehow, he ended up falling down the stairs. And I remember standing at the top, watching this kid go, like, like down, bump, bump, like arms are flailing everywhere, bump, bump. And, and you know, I'm a mom sitting at the top of the stairs, like time has slowed down and my heart is racing. I'm panicking. I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know if, if, if he's going to be okay. And he gets to the bottom and he gets up with the biggest smile on his face and he says, again, again. 18 years is a really long time. I remember uh, he wasn't like, he wasn't totally fearless. So we're not sure why. But even at that age, he was afraid of my brother. My brother would walk into the room. Devin's eyes would start bulging out almost as big as his amazing, cute cheeks. And he would run to the nearest safe arms he could find and almost just jump into them. He was so afraid of my brother. And one day my brother walked into the room and there were no safe arms there. And his eyes got really big. I'm sure, I don't know, because I didn't see, but I do know that the adrenaline started pumping through his system as he ran away as fast as he could from my brother. And he, he ran all the way across the house, went into my parents' room where I was. And I know the adrenaline was in his system because when he went to go open and then close the door, he pulled the thing off his hinges. So that little kid two years old, maybe three, is standing there looking up at the door handle that he's holding as the door is just standing there having no idea what to do. 18 years is a really, really long time. There was a, so he loved baths. I know he loved baths because I couldn't ever get him out of them. But for some reason, he never actually wanted to get in. So, so I called him to the bathroom one day, and I'm like, hey, let's you know, come here. And he came into the bathroom. He saw that I was getting the bath water ready for him. And the second he saw that, that kid started backing up as fast as he could away from the bath. And, and, I, and he ran into the back door. Now, the back door was not latched all the way, apparently, because when he backed into it, it opened. And when it opened, he started falling out. And when he started falling out, he went to catch himself by grabbing the door frame. And when he grabbed the door frame, it swung him around. 
and he hit his head on something. And whatever he hit his head on, it cut him. And you know, the thing about head wounds is they bleed. They bleed a lot. So what would Jesus do? I think Jesus would do the exact same thing I did. I did everything I could to stop that bleeding, to stop him from gushing blood everywhere. I grabbed a towel, put it on his head. I brought him to the emergency room. And at the emergency room, as he was getting three stitches or staples in his head, there's a debate in our house how many he got and what exactly they were. But, but I remember more clearly is him scrunching up his face as he's getting stitches and then opening his eyes and going, well, that wasn't too bad. 18 years is a long, long time. And Friday, he turned 23. You know, earlier this year, he bought a brand new bright yellow FJ Cruiser. Um, and about a week after he had it, I don't even know if it was a week, but I do know that all of the, the stickers were not on it yet. It was still fairly new. And he came home, and I'm like, oh, I'm going to go out, and I look at his car, and I go along the side, and along the side, there's this big, long scratch. I'm like, what'd you do to your car? He was up in the mountains, and he just kind of knocked it over some. That kid is a free spirit. He is rambunctious. He is tenacious. He is amazing. And we have spent the last 20 years loving him, uh, trying to guide him and call him and, and get him on a holy path. We have tried to nurture those parts of him that, that are amazing that are rambunctious, that both get him in trouble and drive him through life. We are so proud of him. And you know what? I hope for him. I hope that there's a moment or two or a dozen in his life that he can stand there in God's presence that God's love and God's grace overflow him to the point that he could say, my soul magnifies the Lord. I read a quote this week in one of the commentaries on today's text that, that said, you know, when eternity touches time, things still happen, but they are so far beyond our understanding. I hope for him. I hope that he has those moments where eternity touches time and his life still happens, but is so far beyond what he can understand. I hope that. I hope that for both of my boys. I hope that for this congregation, for all of you sitting here. I hope that for all of us, in the United Methodist Church, we call that moment, we call that perfecting grace. And when I read today's text, when I read Mary's words, I read this moment where God's love and light is breaking through into the wor world this moment when God's love overflows from her, her life, her heart, where eternity is touching time. Hear now these words from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 1, verses 46 through 56. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord. And my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior, 
for he has looked with favor on the lowliness of his servant. Surely from now on, all generations will call me blessed, for the mighty one has done great things for me, and holy is his name. His mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy according to the promise he made to our ancestors, to Abraham and to his descendants forever. And Mary remained with her about three months and then returned to her home. May God bless the reading, the hearing, and the understanding of this word. God's love and light. God was working in Mary's life long before she could see it, before she could know it, before she could even respond to it. God was there. God was there hundreds of years even. As we read in the prophet's words, God was pointing and nudging and guiding her. And, and then Gabriel shows up. Gabriel shows up in Mary's life, and, and Mary's like, I don't get it. I see you. I know you're here, but I think you're wrong. I'm not good enough. I'm not the person. I don't think I can pull this off. And Gabriel and Mary talk, and, and Mary finally says, okay, I'll trust. I'll believe. I will take steps towards this thing maybe being, may be being possible in my life. And then Mary does take those first steps. She, she sees this holy path that God is calling her to, and, and, and she takes a step on it. And, and that step for her was going with haste to visit her cousin Elizabeth. And when she was there, she saw, Elizabeth saw in her this calling this depth of life, this light in the darkness, Elizabeth saw in Mary something that Mary could not yet see in herself. And there was more there. There was this joy in that visit, this joy that, that just surpasses understanding as, as the baby in Elizabeth's womb leaps for joy in this moment. So there Mary stands. God's nudging, God's calling, God's guiding her towards this moment. Ahead of her lies the struggles, doubts, fears, uh, raising a baby, seeing him die on a cross. She stands there with her past behind her, her future in front of her, and she has experienced her faith coming to life in her, in her light, as, as the promise of light is given to her, as her life goes forth to help change the entire world, to, ble to bring hope and light into this place, eternity touches time in this moment for her. And she sings out, my soul magnifies the Lord. What would Jesus do? What would Jesus do? I, I, I believe that the most priceless beautiful place is your life. Not just your life, my life, your family's life, your friend's life, the baby born today, their life, the homeless man looking for food today, the prisoner that will never taste freedom again. 
I believe our lives are the most precious, beautiful place we will ever find ourselves. And I absolutely believe that God is at work in your life right now in ways that you cannot see it yet, in ways that you can't respond to, in ways you don't know. God is calling you, nudging you, guiding you towards a holy path, saying this way, this is the way, this way. But the fact is, is that I also believe we're broken. We're broken and we're hurting and we make bad choices and sometimes it's not our fault. Sometimes the, the world is just a broken place. Things happen. People get hurt. Illnesses happen. Economies crash. Worldwide pandemics put everything on hold. Sometimes we make bad choices. But sometimes there's just no good choice. And I believe through all of that, God is calling us, nudging us, guiding us towards this holy path. And I believe in justifying grace. I believe that when we take steps onto that path, when we answer God's call, when we say yes, we will take that step. I believe we get on that holy path that path that, that God is calling us to. And I believe in sanctifying grace. I believe every day, every moment, every choice we make is a choice to be on the path again and again. I believe going to worship is a choice to be on the path. I believe prayer is a choice to stay on this holy path. I believe that God continues to work with us, to call us, to guide us to be people that, know, that bring healing and life and light to the world, and that's who we are called to be. And I believe in perfecting grace. I believe in these moments. And maybe they're still really hard. Maybe they're even painful. Maybe they're scary. But somehow in those moments, eternity touches time. Events still happen. Life still happens. But something happens that is so far beyond our understanding. There is no way it was anything but God showing up right there and then. Those are Christmas moments. Those moments where light breaks absolutely in to this world and into our lives. So what would Jesus do? I believe that Jesus, through it all, loves us without any limits, without any boundaries, without any rules or any exceptions. I believe the one that we're, that we're waiting on, this one that is born in a manger and yet is with us, the one that is a baby and died on a cross is here and is there. I believe he continues to love us with the wild, extravagant, abundant, absolute, wild love. Thanks be to God. Merry Christmas. In our United Methodist tradition, we have what's called an open table. That means no matter who you are, no matter how you got here, no matter what your connection is to this church or any church, you are welcome to come. Because this is a meal that offers forgiveness and life and hope. On the last day of Jesus' life, he gathered his disciples together. And in the midst of the meal, he took a piece of bread and he broke. And he said, I want you to eat of this bread I want you to remember me. I want you to remember my life, my words, my witness, my acts of compassion and kindness. And whenever you eat it, 
I want you to remember my body and my life and my ministry. So I invite you to take the bread that you have. I invite you to eat it together. Later in the service, he took a cup. He said, when you drink from this cup, I want you to remember the blood that I have shed for you, blood of forgiveness and grace and mercy. And whenever you drink it, I want you to remember that you are forgiven, that you are a child of God, beloved, just the way you are. So I invite us together to drink. Let us pray. Loving God, we are thankful for this meal that reminds us of your life and ministry, your forgiveness, grace, and mercy. We give you thanks for the chance to share it together in community, that we might see in one another your love and forgiveness. Make this meal be for us, your body and blood, and make our lives be given to you in acts of service and kindness and compassion as we saw in your life. And this week, we remember the greatest gift that you have given to all of us in your son, Jesus Christ. And we offer back our lives to you and our lives in service to him. And for this, we give you thanks now in Jesus' name. Amen.